Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship on this first day of the week. It's good to have so many out today. I know there's been one or two affected again by the virus. We're glad that you're here today and we're here to worship our God in heaven. So God bless you for being here. It's good to have Isaac and his family for the last time. I understand that you're going back to Ghana next week. Next week. So we're glad that you're here to worship with us. We're sorry you're going. Just got to know you, it seems like, anyway. So God bless you in that. And I'm sure everyone will want to take the opportunity to see you after the worship service. Wish you all the very best moving back there. The football boys isn't nearly as good in Ghana, as was evidenced by the recent African Cup of Nations. Just say, sorry guys, but it's true. Tomorrow's win. Anyway, uh, we're here for our worship. Welcome to those on Zoom and on Truth FM. I'm glad that you're here this morning. We invite our brother Mike to open us with our first prayer this morning. Can we have everyone uh, stand in place? If you can. And if you can. Lord God in heaven, we come to you on the first day of the week to give you honour and praise. This honour and praise, God, is due to you because of the commitment that you put out towards us. Or you went to your death for our salvation. Lord God, please be with everyone today taking the service. Have them talk from truth, from truth and, sp and, sp and spirit with boldness of heart and of mind. Lord God, allow us to follow your word every day of the week. Allow us, Lord God, to leave our troubles and strifes outside this door today so that we can concentrate on your word, so that we can focus on you fully today. Lord God, please be with the people that can't make the service today. Please be with them throughout today and throughout the week. Lord God, I ask you this in the glorious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Morning, everyone. I'm just trying to count how many folk are here today. It seems so spread out, you know, but as soon as we can get closer together and sing some songs of praise, the better. First song this morning is number 238. You are the song that I sing. Let's sing this through twice, if you will. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you song that you gave to me, you are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music, you are the song that I sing. You are the melody, you are the harmony, praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the you are the king of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I Readings taken from 2 Kings, chapter 23, starting from verse 31. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. 
and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bonds at Ribla, in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the place of Josiah his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But he took Jehoahaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land from everyone according to his assessment to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibida, the daughter of Hadiah of Rumah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Morning. The New Testament reading is from Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in a vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by, by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols, gold, idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their uh, sorceries, or their sexual immoralities, or their thefts. Amen. Number 509, I will sing the wondrous story. Do you want to stand for this one if you can? <clears throat> I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. 
he will keep me till the river rolls its waters off my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wonder story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Be seated, please. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are grateful to you for the life that we have in you. We thank you, Father, that you send your son to die for our sins and iniquity. We thank you, Father, that we are able to gather here this morning to worship you in truth and in spirit. We thank you for, we can call you our Father. And we are your children. At this hour, we remember young men of God. In every society, in every community, is the youth that the pillar, because they are the one that will grow up and continue to carry the legacy. We pray for the young men of God that you strengthen them spiritually, especially as they face a lot of challenges in this world. We pray that you help them to be able to focus solely on you, on your word, and not be distracted by the excitement of the world. And with the program starting tonight, we pray for all the young men of God that will be participating, that will be bringing messages to us, that you help them with their preparation and with the message that will bring it to us, that you give them that wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to be able to divide your word and present the message to us. And through these messages, we can know you better. And through these messages, they themselves will be able to grow in the knowledge of you. Thank you, Father, for we pray in Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen. Before we partake of the, the Lord's Supper, number 337, I think is very appropriate, very poignant words in this song. Let's sing it in remembrance of the Christ that died for us. Man of sorrows, what a name! For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing. Thank you. 
Morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, I'm going to read uh, an article which uh, came from the Guardian newspaper, because uh, I think quite a lot of time, a lot of what we believe uh, about Jesus may stem exclusively from uh, what we read in the Bible. Uh, the person who wrote it is called Simon Gathercole. Uh, he wrote this in 2017. I have used it a few times. Uh, if you like, this is my greatest hits version of the Lord's Table. It's the one that I drag out every now and again, because uh, I really like the article. Uh, and it just gives us some more historical context to, to what happened uh, and what actually is the historical evidence that Jesus Christ lived and died. Uh, and the reason the person wrote it is that he, his first line says, today some claim that Jesus is just an idea rather than a real historical figure, but there is a good deal of written evidence for his existence 2,000 years ago. Uh, how confident can we be that Jesus Christ actually lived? The historical evidence for Jesus of Nazareth is both long established and widespread. Within a few decades of his supposed lifetime, he is mentioned by Jewish and Roman historians as well as by dozens of Christian writings. And what do these Christian writings tell us? The value of this evidence is that it's both early and detailed. The first Christian writings to talk about Jesus are the epistles of St. Paul, and scholars agree that the earliest of these letters were written within 25 years of Jesus' death at the very latest. Well, the detailed biographical accounts of Jesus in the New Testament Gospels date from around 40 years after he died. These all appeared within the lifetimes of numerous eyewitnesses and provide descriptions that comport with the culture and geography of first century Palestine. It is also difficult to imagine why Christian writers would invent such a thoroughly Jewish saviour figure in a time and place under the Aegeus of the Roman Empire, where there was strong suspicion of Judaism. What did non-Christian authors say about Jesus? As far as we know, the first author outside the church to mention Jesus is the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, who wrote a history of Judaism about AD 93. He has two references to Jesus. One of these is controversial because it's thought to be corrupted by Christian scribes, eh, probably turning a negative account into a more positive one. But the other is not suspicious, a reference to James, the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ. About 20 years after Josephus, we have the Roman politicians Pliny and Tacitus, Tacitus, who held some of the highest offices of state at the beginning of the second century AD. From Tacitus, we learn that Jesus was executed while Pontius Pilate was the Roman prefect in charge of Judea. Uh, that was about AD 26 to 36, and Tiberius was emperor. That was AD 14 to 37. Reports that fit within the time frame of the Gospels. Pliny contributes, that the, inf contributes the information that, where he was governor in northern Turkey, Christian worshipped Christ as a god. Neither of them like Christians. Plenty writes of their pig-headed stubbornness. Uh, I don't think that could apply to me, Emma, at all. Uh, and Tacitus calls their religion a destructive superstition. Did ancient writers discuss the existence of Jesus? Strikingly, there was never any debate in the ancient world about whether Jesus of Nazareth was a historical figure. 
In the earliest literature of the Jewish rabbis, Jesus was denounced as the illegitimate child of Mary and a sorcerer. Among pagans, uh, he was dismissed as a scoundrel, but we know of no one in the ancient world to question whether Jesus actually lived. And how controversial is the existence of Jesus now? Uh, in a recent book, there's a French philosopher who talks of Jesus as a mere hypothesis, his existence as an idea rather than as a historical figure. Uh, about 10 years ago, the Jesus Project was set up in the US. One of the, its main questions for discussion was that of whether or not Jesus existed. Some authors have even argued that Jesus of Nazareth is doubly non-existent, containing that both Jesus and Nazareth are Christian inventions. It is worth noting, though, that the two mainstream historians who have written most against these hyper-skeptical arguments are actually atheists. And I have the two names if you wish to see them later on. Uh, one of the big things is, is there any archaeological evidence of Jesus? Now, the article goes way off track and talks about Jesus possibly being the great-grandson of Cleopatra and stuff like this. Uh, Dick and Armour at the British Museum, and they brought back a book about evidence of uh, uh, of the Bible, which is a very interesting book. But one of the things is there's a, an ossuary that was found in Jerusalem, and it was marked as James, the brother of Jesus. I think it says the son of Joseph as well, which is a really strange thing it says in this book, because normally you would only name the father. You wouldn't actually name the brother of someone unless it's someone who's of real, real uh, importance. So, but when we look through this, uh, it's... Uh, uh, Sorry, just lost my place here. These abundant historical references leave us with little reasonable doubt that Jesus lived and died. But the article finishes with this question, which is uh, the more interesting question, which goes beyond history and objective fact, is whether Jesus died and lived. Now, what I want to look at is obviously we believe that Jesus died and lived and is the son of God. And if you look in John 20, uh, we'll read from 24 to the end of the chapter here which is an incident with Jesus and Thomas, and it talks about the purpose of the book of John. So verse 24 starts, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger in the marks of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Then the next two verses explain the purpose of John's gospel, which are, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So this passage, which features Thomas, ends with a great verse for future believers in Jesus, which includes us, that we are already being blessed by Jesus. And the purpose of John's book explains that it was written so we might believe in Jesus and gain eternal life through him. So this time, let's offer thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of the week that we can meet as your church, we can meet around this table to remember your son, we can uh, remember uh, the sacrifice that he made and what we gain by being uh, in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a symbol of your son's blood, uh, the blood that cleanses us free of our sins, the blood which spilt that cross at Calvary. Father, we thank you for the faith that we have in Jesus, and we pray that you'll continue to strengthen and encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Number 719, love one another. Something that Jesus asked us to do. <clears throat> Angry words, oh, let them never from my tongue and bridle oh, slip. May the heart's best impulse ever take them early soil. Say the Savior, children obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, blessed the Savior, children obey the blessed command. Love is much to pure and holy. Sacred fire for a moment's reckless folly, thus to desolate and mock. Love one another, thus say the Savior, children obey. Today's sermon reading is Matthew chapter 25, verses 37 to 40. And this will be on uh, this will be for Adam's sermon. So that's Matthew verse 25. No, Matthew chapter 5, verse 37 to 40. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord. When do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you some something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Let me just get set up here. Right. Thank you, Finley, for reading that passage. I know I, I changed that on you at the last minute. So I appreciated uh, Finley reading that for us and reading it so well. You know, I was reading the devotional book. Uh, you know, in preparation for the lesson today, and the guy was talking about, he took some of his neighbours, <clears throat> new neighbours, uh, a burger for lunch, if you read it, a burger for lunch and an ice cold Dr Pepper. So it put me in the mood for some Dr Pepper. Oh, that's good. Actually, 
does anybody remember what the the marketing slogan for Dr. Pepper was back in the 80s? Somebody tell me what it was. What's the worst that could happen? <clears throat> That's right, but it was actually only introduced in the in the UK because apparently uh, UK consumers didn't know what it tasted like and were a bit wary of tasting it. So they came up with these adverts, what's the worst that could happen? And that leads us on to a game that we're going to play. So I was going to ask for a volunteer, one of our young girl volunteers, but Anna Rose, you're the only one still in the room. So that means it falls on you. Could you come up and help me out? Now you don't have to take part if you don't want, all right? But come on, stand here, and I'll explain what you have to do if you decide to go for it, okay? Now, this game's called Chancing Your Arm, all right? Chancing Your Arm, and I'll explain why in a wee minute. Because I've got three bags here, and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to stick your arm in one of them and pick out whatever it is, all right? You can choose what bag. Now, in one of them, there's a bar of chocolate. In another one, there's an old sweaty sock, one of mine. And in the other one, there's an old dirty cloth that we used to clean the minibus. There was going to be a worm, and I dug about for a worm, and I couldn't find one. I should have got that one the other day. But so you don't have to have the worm. Now, are you willing to play? You're going to stick your hand in. Now, I should tell you, the other rule is that whatever one you get, you have to take a bite of it right here in front of everybody. <laughs> Do you want to do it? You don't have to. You can say no. She's not so keen now. She nodded earlier. Ah, oh, hand right in there. But if you have to take a bite, and if you get a chocolate, it's fine. Do you want to pass or do you want to go? Pass. Okay. I was afraid that might happen. Hold, 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 hold on. Not finished yet. What about if I give you a pound? Would you go for it? <laughs> what about I give you two pounds? No? Can't tempt you? Okay, okay, okay. What about if I give you ten pounds? Still no, really? <laughs> Someone told you about my feet? <laughs> Twenty pounds. Still no! Okay, okay, hold on. What about if I write you a check? <laughs> 50 pounds. Still no? Okay, I don't blame you. You can go and have your seat. Oh, wait a minute, do you know what? Since you were a good sport, you can have the chocolate. There you go, you can take, take that. Take the bag, it's fine. <clears throat> I didn't think so. I wouldn't do it for 50 pounds either. I don't know, I might think about it for 50 pounds. It is my own sock after all. That game's called Chance in Your Arm. Do you know the the origin of the of the expression chancing your arm? Graham, could you put up the next slide, please? There's a there's a door hanging in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. And it's called the Door of Reconciliation. I don't know if you can see that there. I know it's kind of dim, dim picture here. But you'll see it's an old, old wooden door with a hole cut in the middle. Now, what happened with the Door of Reconciliation was two very prominent Irish families back in 1942 were having a, a feud. Still had feuds back in those days. And it was the Ormonds and the Kildares. So Sir James Butler, who was the Earl of Ormond, he was under attack by Gerald Fitzgerald, who was the Earl of Kildare. And he was under such heavy attack that him and his followers took refuge in the chapter house of St. Patrick's Cathedral. And they locked themselves in there for safety. So Gerald Fitzgerald and his family, they sieged the, they sieged the chapel. At some point in the siege, Fitzgerald comes to the conclusion, this is nonsense. Here we are, two families from the same country, worshipping the same God in the same church building on the first day of the week. And here we are trying to kill each other. That doesn't make sense. So what he did was he shouted in to Ormond, James Butler, Earl of Ormond, and he shouted in, come on out, 
let, basically let's be friends. In fact, exactly what he said was what's inscribed there beside the door. He undertook on his honour that he should receive no villainy. Just old speak for saying to James Butler, listen, I won't harm you. You can come out in safety. Ormond didn't believe him. So Ormond didn't answer. So the next step Fitzgerald took was he took his spear and he hewed out that hole that you see in the middle of the door and he stuck his arm in the hole and someone inside another hand grabbed the arm and they opened the door and the two men embraced and the feud was over. And that's where the expression chanting your arm comes from. Now, Fitzgerald did the right thing. He did a good thing. But there was risk involved there. Ormond could have cut off his arm if he didn't want, if he didn't want to end the feud. There was risk involved. Now, that takes us to, I'll keep a marker in Matthew 25, because we will go back there. But that does take us to a real text, which if you were reading the MTs thing in the middle of the week, you'll know that it was saying that we were going to be preaching from John 13 in the first five verses. It also takes us to the real theme for today, which you'll know if you were reading your devotions from My Life and Him, and that is that the, the subject for this week is serve one another. Well, how do we go from serve one another to, well, the, the initial, the initial um, title of the sermon was Risk It. I've just changed it to Chance. You can put it onto the next slide again. Thanks again. I just changed it to Chance Your Arm at the last minute. How do we go? I can get where we get serve one another from John 13, 1 through 5. How do we go to this risk factor here? Let's read the first five verses. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. It doesn't seem that long ago that I preached a lesson from this passage about service. And I remember talking about the fact that, you know, we have Jesus setting us an, an example here. And, and sometimes we concentrate on the lowliness of the service. But Jesus was just setting an example of being a servant. Because that's who he is. That's who our God is. That's what he does all the time. And we looked at that, just meeting needs. Meeting needs every day. Some big, some small. But that's what he does. But I never realized, really, the risk involved in service until it was brought to my attention by I think Stephen Bailey, was the writer of, uh, of chapter 19, until it was brought to my attention by Stephen Bailey in the devotionals from my life and him. In fact, marked a couple of things. It was really when he got to day three, which is page 112, if you're at home and you're looking at your book, or well, you've got your book handy enough to look at it. But in page, in page 112, we've got Wednesday's devotional, and the title is actually, At What Cost Do I Risk Serving? But at the bottom, when they make that little commitment, he, he gives the story there um, for his uh, devotional. And at the bottom, he says, today I will, and then the author makes a little self-promise that, that I guess they want us to adopt or take on as a challenge. So he says, today, I will risk. In other words, and he's, he's talking about inconvenience. The, the middle paragraph, he actually says, have you ever asked yourself this question? What if Jesus only demonstrated servanthood when it was convenient for him? Horrific thought, to be honest. But really, the, the point there is, this service, whatever it may be, whatever you choose to do, whatever you choose to risk, this service may inconvenience me, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to serve anyway. And then in the next devotional, 
uh, Thursday's devotional on page 114, again at the bottom, he says, today I will risk. And he goes on to talk about how he'll risk. And uh, the, his point there is really uh, along the lines of this service may challenge me. In fact, this service is going to challenge me. He mentions comfort zone there in that bottom paragraph. Take me out of comfort zone. This service, even if it challenges me, I'm going to serve anyway. And then on his last one, in Friday's devotional, again at the bottom, he says, uh, today I will risk. And he talks about uh, a guy, Tyler Perry, who, to begin with, anonymously paid off a bunch of people's debts that they had for Walmart, and, you know, all that kind of thing. You can read the story. It's very interesting. But he says, today I will risk. And the point he's making is to this, this service, whatever it is we choose to do, this service may cost me. And, and, and not just financially, don't, don't, Limit it to that. This service may cost me, but I'm going to do it anyway. The MT's video, if in fact, Graham, that's the next slide. Can you go ahead and play that again? It's only 45 seconds long, just in case anyone has seen it. Follows the same train of thought. Living with open hands really the title of that video, Living with Open Hands. Thanks, Graham. And it gives us, the first two examples was of, of the young boy in John chapter 6. If, uh, if you go there, verses, we'll just read verse 4 through 9, because we know the story well. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward them, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Jesus said this to test them. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him and says, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to even get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves, little tiny loaves, and two fish. But what are they for so many? We know there were 5,000 men. The the video is talking about living with open hands. It's talking about giving. It's talking about serving through giving, even what little we have. But it's a great example of the risk that we're taking, because here's an opportunity for this wee boy to serve. Now, I don't know how that came about. I really don't. I, I'm trying to figure out what one's more likely. Did Simon see a wee boy with, uh, sorry, Andrew? Did Andrew see a wee boy with five loaves and two fish and say, I'm going to go up and ask that wee boy for his little loaves and fish, because that'll help. And that seems unlikely, you know? It seems more likely that the wee boy's there, and he's heard what's going on, and he went up to Andrew and said, well, this isn't much, but you, ha you can have it. And maybe thinking others would join in and give uh, something and serve in that way as well. So that seems more likely, but however it happened, it just interests me. The wee boy took a risk. Now, what, what, what risk did he take? Well, you, you can go ahead and answer. What were some of the risks that this wee boy took in giving what little food he had to feed maybe 20,000 people? There, there would be none left for himself. And probably, more importantly, none left for the family when they get back home. I always think the mums sent them to get the food. It, it, it strikes me that Jack and the Beanstalk may have come from this story. Because the wee boy goes back and says to his mum, and his mum says, where's the food from the shop, the market? I gave it to a man, and he fed 20,000 people. That's not, that's not going to be like the magic beans. That's going to get thrown out the window, you know? Uh, the mum's not going to be happy. So, yeah, he risks having no food left and probably getting reprimanded when he goes home. Anything else? Probably. Get, can you imagine? Oh, son, go. Be quiet. That's ridiculous. Ridiculed maybe by the disciples. 
ridiculed maybe by those around him. What? What are you talking about? You're off your... Yeah, anything else? Laughed at, mocked, maybe envied, maybe when it all went well. Maybe some would be, yeah, I wish I'd done it. So maybe they, they turn against him. Maybe he's just dismissed. Listen, maybe he's just pushed to the side afterwards and he's not even appreciated. He takes a risk when he serves. That's what happens here. Serving's going to involve risk. But he served anyway. And he found it was worth it. The other example he get the, the, the video gives us from Mark 12. If you want to go back to there, Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> let's read uh, just let's read 41 to 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money. This is Jesus putting money into the offering box. Jesus is watching them. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contribute out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. Now think about the opportunity to serve here. This isn't a parable. This isn't a story Jesus is making up about a fictional person. This is Jesus watching a real believer go to the treasury and give in his words all that she had to live on. Serving God through our giving one way and serving others through what she gave to those who would decide what was to be done with that offering. Where's the risk? What are some of the risks that she might have taken? That's the most dramatic one. You straight to the straight to the you know the, the big impact. She said it's all she had to live on. What's she going to eat? We're talking about a risk. I mean, I, I put down some others. Um, maybe she would have been scorned. Maybe we, she would have been shunned. Maybe she would have been judged. Maybe she would have been shamed. But I guess the big one is maybe she she would have gone hungry. And she served anyway. She knew the risk. And she served her God and her fellow man in spite of those risks. Think subconsciously that's how we make decisions. We don't, we don't, we don't realize we're thinking about it, but I think subconsciously we think, what's the worst that could happen? And then we decide what we're going to do. And she decided she was going to serve. Now, that takes us back to our original passage, our original proper text, John 13. Still going to come back to Matthew 25 in a couple of minutes. But if you go back to John 13, let's read that again. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Look at an opportunity to sit. There's an opportunity to serve here. Because Jesus knew what they needed, right? Jesus knew that they needed to have their feet washed because they were dirty. But more importantly, Jesus knew that the world was going to need humble servants. Yeah, he was washing their feet. But he was showing them who they would need to be for the world. He was showing us who we would need to be for each other because Jesus knew that in our lives, we would need those around us who would humbly serve. And so he tells us to serve one another. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Verse 
You know, I see a lot of, my, a lot of passages are my favourite passages, but this is always one of them. And it uh, has been for years. One of my favourite passages, Philippians 2. Look at verse, uh, let's read 5 through 7. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus decided to serve. Now, we knew the risks. What were the risks for Jesus serving, even as he washes the feet? What are the risks he's taken as the, as the Lord, as the creator of the universe, and he stoops down to wash the feet of the disciples? What are the risks that he's taken? Loss of respect. Misunderstood. Disappointment. We know he felt it. At times. Anything else? Sorry? Ridiculed? Misrepresented? It mentions Judas in that passage in John 13. Betrayed? The other disciples? Abandoned? And then we come to this passage in Philippians 2 and we go on and read verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on the cross. When Jesus decided to come to this earth to serve us, he took a risk. One of the risks was that he was going to be murdered. Not even a risk, guarantee. And he was. If you go to Mark chapter 10, verse 45, and just um, see how much that was part of his decision to serve. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That was part of the, that was the opportunity to serve. That was how Jesus chose to serve. Scripture is full of examples of those who risked serving God and serving one another. Some in big ways, Noah, Moses, uh, I've written down here uh, Esther, risked her life to serve her people, Hosea, risked everything to teach the people by marrying uh, Gomer. Some in much smaller ways, Rahab, in a way that was a big risk. She could have, she could have uh, lost her life for taking in those spies. But I think of even someone like Naaman's little servant girl who spoke up when Naaman didn't want to listen to the words of the prophet. And she just goes to him and says, Master, if he'd ask you, you know, just little ways. People taking a stand or people risking something to serve their fellow man or the woman in the New Testament who bends down to wash Jesus' feet. She took a risk. If you know the story, you'll know some of the risks that she, that she, took, that she took. And so after reading the devotionals and thinking about this, I, I, I've come to the conclusion that when we really serve, there's always going to be some sort of risk. God asks us to serve one another and when he does that, he asks us to take a risk and do that. Sometimes it'll be a big risk, sometimes it'll be small. But maybe that's one of the things that puts us off being a servant. There's other things about service, I guess, that put people off. But maybe this is one of them. The fact that there's going to be a risk. The fact that perhaps we're worried it won't be worth it. That perhaps we're thinking, no, I can't take that chance. I can't take, we decide I can't risk that. And so maybe we don't try something because maybe it will fail. Or maybe we don't make that offer of service because maybe it will be refused or maybe it won't be returned or maybe it will be unappreciated. Maybe we don't reach out to a brother or a sister or someone who's not even a member of this family. And we don't reach out to them because maybe we'll be ignored. 
Maybe we'll be abused. Maybe we'll be taken advantage of. Maybe we don't forgive. Forgiveness is a need that we all have. And so when we forgive, we're meeting that need. Well, maybe we don't forgive because maybe we'll be hurt again. Maybe they'll do the same thing another time. So we don't offer that service. Maybe we don't encourage a brother or sister because maybe we'll be discouraged if that doesn't come back to us. Maybe we don't serve because it's not worth the risk. Let's go back to Matthew 25, passage that Fenley read for us. Let's just read it again. Fenley did a great job, but let's read it again. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And there is the crux of serving one another. Whoever we serve, whenever we serve, in whatever way we serve one another, it's actually the same as serving the Lord. It's actually as if we did it to Jesus himself. Who's going to say that that is not worth the risk? By the way, when Jesus came to be a servant to us, the biggest risk, the worst that could happen was actually not that he was murdered on the cross. The worst that could happen for those who are not Christians is that they reject that service. The worst that could happen for those of us who are Christians is that we neglect that service. And we do that when we don't serve one another. God asks us, the MT's video challenged us, I'm encouraging us to live with open hands, serve one another with risk. Yes, someone may grab what you have in that open hand and take it off you, and then may even nail those same offering serving hands to the wall in hostility. Yes, that may happen. That's what happened to our Lord who served for us. Will we serve one another for him? God bless. Thank you, Adam. Let's sing number one six one six two. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and cry him. and 
You will not be surprised to uh, know that what I'm going to say now is going to uh, tie in a wee bit with what Adam has just been talking about. Particularly in the Old Testament, we have quite a few references to the uh, idea of tithing. Tithing. Uh, the word tithe means one tenth of annual produce. produce or earnings. And tithing was mentioned quite a lot throughout the Old Testament. Probably everyone is aware that it was part of the Mosaic law. However, the word and the activity occurs before that. The first mention is in uh, Genesis 14, where Abram, as he was then, Abram, gave a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, the uh, priest king. The next occurrence where it's mentioned is in Genesis uh, 28, verses 20 to uh, 22, uh, which I'll read. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou givest me, I will give the tenth to thee. So Abraham made a gift of a tenth of everything that he had to Melchizedek. The next time Abraham's grandson, Jacob, made a covenant, a commitment to God that he would return a tenth of everything that he had as a deal if God looked after him. But it's really in the Mosaic law where the idea of tithing becomes um, fixed. And we can see in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy lots of details, often which are quite complex, of the rules which the Israelites had to abide by in order to tithe their wealth to God. And it was 10%, one-tenth, 10% of everything that they had. Now, some people suggest, and you may have heard people suggesting, that Christians should give at least 10% of their income to God based on what the Hebrews call the better covenant between God and man. Hebrews uh, chapter 8 and verse 6. <clears throat> but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry which is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So we could interpret that or extrapolate it to say 
in the old law, it was 10%. So now it should be more than 10%. But also in Hebrews chapter 7, previous chapter and verse 18, we have the point that Jesus set aside the Mosaic law. On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So the rule of tithing is also set aside. And we don't need to worry or be concerned or do calculations based on 10% on one tenth. So what do we do? This is the question that we face really perhaps every Sunday, certainly every time we receive our income, it's something that we need to think about. Perhaps the best thing that we can do is to follow the example that Jesus remarked upon. And this is where we tie in totally with what uh, Adam was speaking about. I'm going to use the Luke version. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow put in two copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the living that she had. So it's not simply to offer whatever may be left over by Sunday, whatever we may have as spare change or a few pound notes. Well, they wouldn't be pound notes now, would they? But a few notes in our um, wallet. That's not what we should be doing. We should not be contributing out of our wealth and saying, well, I don't need this. So I'll put this into the collection. But we should decide in a purposeful manner, in a thoughtful manner, what we need, what we can, indeed what we should offer to our Lord. And then we should stick to that. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, in verse, beginning of verse 6, the point is this, he who spares so, who he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you may always have enough of everything and may provide in abundance for every good work. So this morning, as we consider the offering, let us each think about how we can contribute in order to provide the abundant opportunity for good works to be performed on behalf of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us each and every day. The blessings that so often we take for granted, that we're not aware of. Yet, Father, we know that you're continually watching over us, continually ensuring our welfare. Father, help us to respond to that by purposing to give generously, willingly, and cheerfully, that your work may prosper, that we may enable your work to prosper on this earth, in the various places that work can be done. Father, bless each one of us and help us this day to ensure that we give of our means accordingly. Bless us, Father, in all things, and in this thing in particular. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand and sing number 508, A Wonderful Saviour. And remain standing, please, for the opening, uh, the closing prayer. <clears throat> A wonderful Saviour is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Saviour to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holds shall not be moved, he gave us me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. Each moment he cried, I'm filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a bright thirsty light. He hideth my light in the depths of His love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand let's pray Father, we are so grateful for this day that you've blessed us with. We are so grateful for the chance to be here together as a family, Father, to worship you, to honor you, to praise you, to, to sing to you, Father, to speak from your word, to give that message to each other. Father, we have been encouraged by what we've heard today. Father, we, we have been encouraged by each other, Father, by the comfort that we gain from being with each other, Father, by the comfort that we get from being in your presence. Father, as we go about our day and about our week, Father, may we cherish what we have, may we cherish what we seek, Father, and that we can bring you where, uh, with us wherever we go, Father, that we can feel blessed, that we can feel your presence around us. Father, bless us on our journey together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.